we have all this, this, this melting pot of people, but if we could just blend together and work together, that becomes a great political power and a great financial power. This week on the show, fancy investing in the businesses in your neighborhood instead of in far off global corporations? It turns out that it's not so easy to move your money. There are even laws on the books against it. We'll talk with local finance expert Michael Schumann and meet a group that is funding its own startup without deep pockets or Wall Street. All that's coming up and a few thoughts from me on our free press and the NATO chief kept out of it. Can local economies survive when some major corporations are bigger than nations? Our next guest thinks it's just possible. His name is Michael Schumann, and he's written many books on community economics, including Local Dollars, Local Sense, How to Move Your Money from Wall Street to Main Street and Achieve Real Prosperity. Michael, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Nice to be with you. What do you mean by real prosperity? What's fake prosperity? Well, fake prosperity is, is having a lot of money and then losing it. Um, I think a lot of people think that Wall Street delivers 10, 20 percent uh, return on an annual basis because they have very selective memories. They remember the good years, not the bad ones. And I also mean real prosperity in terms of remembering what matters to you. Mm. Um, the book that you mentioned, Local Dollars, Local Cents, I, I dedicate to my dad, um, who had died while I was writing the book. And I, you know, he never thought he would be rich on Wall Street. He was just very, very sparing with his money. What did he do? Uh, he was a mid-level engineer for the telephone company before they were dismantled by the courts. Mm. Um, and he was, he just really invested in family and community and friends. And to me, to me, that is part of what creative local investing is, is knowing how, what matters. Is that how you got into all of this? Frankly, I would, I would trace this to a um, 35, 40 year quest to, to connect global problems with local action and how do you, how do you do that? The first half of my professional life, I organized mayors and city council members to get them involved in what I called municipal foreign policy. What was Think, that? Things like divestment from South Africa, sister cities with uh, controversial places like Nicaragua or El Salvador, nuclear free zones. And then I started thinking about, well, could we do this with North-South development cooperation? And I found some really interesting practitioners out there who had great ideals, but were using old paradigms in economics. Mm -hmm. And I realized I need to figure out how community econ economies can work mm -hmm. in my own backyard before inflicting further damage on other people abroad. So what do local dollars look like? What, what is a local dollar in your frame? So a local dollar uh, is how as individuals or as households or as businesses we put more and more of our money into local businesses. Businesses that are locally owned and controlled within our community. Now some of us define our communities as neighborhoods, some as cities, some as states, some as regions. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not very demanding on all of that. I think just mindfully thinking about who are the businesses that we feel really connected to and, and putting our money in there. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, your chance of being snookered by an Enron style fraud mm -hmm. when you actually have personal experience with a business person is going to be much lower. Another thing is, is that in addition to the financial return that you might get as an investor, there are all these additional returns that come to your community. So because that business is operating, you have a better tax base, better education, better public services. That's, that's important. I think 
another thing that happens too is that every business you support in your community starts spending money with other businesses. So if you have a local investment portfolio with two or three businesses, all of them are spending with one another. And in a way, you've created a synergy in your portfolio that you could never do if you were investing in just global corporations. All right, so it sounds fantastic. How much of our mutual fund dollars, pension funds, um, Wall Street investments, how much of them are invested in local businesses? There are 7,500 mutual funds in the United States, and not a single one invests a penny in local small business. Uh, there's $30 trillion that Americans have in long-term savings, and, and those savings fall in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, which we just talked about, insurance funds, and pension funds. And probably about a tiny fraction of 1% of that money touches local small business. And, and the reason- So where is the money? Well, it's all in Wall Street. And it's so crazy because at least, it depends how you count it. When but you it, say in Wall Street, you mean in, in big international and national publicly owned corporations? Absolutely. Now, there's a little bit of that money in, in the bonds that, say, go into municipal bonds and U.S. government bonds. So it's not 100% Wall Street, but it's mostly Wall Street and, and big government projects. And, and what's insane about that is that because more than half the economy is local small business in terms of jobs and output. We know that that sector of the economy is extremely profitable and competitive. So if we had an efficient capital market, roughly speaking about half of our money, half of, half of that $30 trillion would be going into local small business, but nothing is. So why isn't it? People just haven't read your book? They don't care? They didn't notice? Well, uh, hopefully they are noticing now. And what I, I try to point out in the book is that what started as a very uh, beneficent set of laws, securities laws that were passed during the 1930s to prevent people from being taken in by frauds, um, have gotten applied in ways that just make it exceedingly difficult for 99% of the public, which are called unaccredited investors. You, basically, unaccredited investors are not wealthy people, or not the wealthiest mm -hmm. people, and the wealthiest 1% are, are accredited investors. So you mean you can't just go and give your local business an investment, say, I really like your cafe, I'm going to give you $1,000, I'd like a return at some point, let's draw up a deal. If you were an accredited investor, if you were in the top 1%, you are allowed to invest in anything, anytime, no questions asked. And how do I get to be an accredited investor? You would have to have individually income of $200,000 a year, or if you're in a couple, $300,000 a year, or wealth of a million dollars excluding your house. So it's an extremely exclusive club to be an accredited investor. Now, I call the situation investment apartheid because it really created two very distinct classes in the American public with two very different sets of rights. And if you're in the unaccredited investor class, you can only put a penny into a small local business if that business has done anything from twenty-five to hundred thousand dollars of legal work. And that legal work in theory is to inform you, the unaccredited investor, here's everything that could go wrong with this investment. And we're going to give you a thick book, 100 pages long, eight point font. No human being has ever been observed to read these things, but that book is going to be the basis uh, for your being fully informed of the risks, and then you can put your money into that business. So if I was wanting to start a, I don't know, cafe co-op or something with a bunch of my friends, and we were going to go around and try to raise the funds, you're saying I couldn't do that without putting that kind of investment into the legal documentation and going to investors who had that kind of creditation that you mentioned? So there are, in every state, there are exemptions to the law. 
And one exemption that exists in some form or another is friends and family. Mm. So friends and family can work together, but your Facebook friends don't count as mm. friends. Some states are pretty demanding about what those friendly relations would be. And this was all set up in the 30s as part of our protection against fraud? Yes, set up in the 30s and reinforced in laws ever since then. So what can we do? You, you have the second part of your title for that book is Local Sense. There are some alternatives. You're also working, as I understand it, on a, a new book that has to do with businesses working in different ways to um, stimulate a different kind of growth. Uh, talk a bit about what are, the, what are the alternatives out there and some examples, perhaps, that you've seen. Well, I think there are some incredible examples. And, and you know, just within the law right now, there's a lot of things that people can do. A lot of, you know, one, for example, one of the historic um, places where people have done a local investment is through cooperatives. Um, and the reason why cooperative investing is a little bit easier is a, a co-op does have to issue the securities documents as everyone else does. But co-ops, as a matter of principle, share things with one another. So if I've spent $25,000 on, on a set of attorneys for my documents, I am perfectly willing to share that with 100 other co-ops and then they play the game of Mad Libs to simply change a few words and voila, instant legal document. And then I can borrow money from my members and put that money into, say, a second store if I'm a grocery co-op. Another example is your local bank and credit union. We know that a local bank and credit union is about three or four times more likely to take a dollar you put on deposit and lend that to a small business. So if you care about supporting local businesses, moving your money is a very important act. Um, some credit unions and some banks have also set up specialty certificates of deposit. So an example would be Equal Exchange in Boston. They approached their local bank and said, why don't you set up a special certificate of deposit to support fair trade businesses like ourselves? And the bank thought, you know, this is a cool idea because people are invited to put money on deposit. If, if the lent loans do well, the bank gets their fees. If the loans get lost, they're fully collateralized, and the bank gets their fees. So the bank thought this is a great thing. And so as a result, Equal Exchange now has a $1 million line of credit. So all of those things, and we could, we could talk about 25 more, are done within the existing law. Mm -hmm. But what's been really exciting over the last couple of years is the law is changing. Mm -hmm. People are sick of it. And a weird coalition, political coalition, in uh, you could say Tea Party Republicans, locavor progressives, and high-tech young people who wanted to sell the apps on their iPhones, they all collaborated together and pushed Congress into passing what became known as the Jobs Act, which was a major reform of securities law um, that could, in theory, make it much cheaper for small businesses to get crowdfunding investment uh, for their business. Now, the problem is, is that the Securities and Exchange Commission was supposed to implement the regulations for this in December of 2012, and here we are almost two years later, and they refused to do their homework. Mm. Is there anything local governments can do to change this picture? States have the power to redefine yeah. their securities laws. And what's, what's been interesting is that since the Securities and Exchange Commission has basically you know, been squatting on the JOBS Act and saying we're not going to implement it, about a dozen states have passed their own securities reforms. In my own state of Maryland, a woman approached me about six months ago and said, if I want to write a small check to, to a business, why can't I do it? Well, so this is saying if it's a small check, no lawyers need to be involved. Yeah. So she successfully moved this into both houses of our state house last year. It was passed unanimously in both state houses, and it's now law. Mm -hmm. So we are now the only state in the country with a $100 exemption for people who want a loan of up to 
$100,000 for their business. In international trade circles, we often see global corporations or countries suing local municipalities who have by local preferences um, made a decision to try to support local businesses over multinational corporations or another mall. Do securities work the same way? Is there global regulation that could interfere with this movement? It, yes, and, and some of the trade treaties that are up for uh, consideration get much more explicit about investment, and yes, they could stand in the way of local authorities that wanted to move their money. Now that said, I think there's a good way around these laws. Um, both with respect to purchasing and with, with investment. But let's, I think it's easier to sort of see the argument with respect to purchasing. You know, 25 years ago, when I was a municipal purchasing agent, I wasn't, but hypothetically, if I had two bulbs here, so a compact, compact fluorescent that would cost 10 bucks and an incandescent bulb that would cost one buck. Okay, I was not allowed to ask the question, how long do these two bulbs last? Mm -hmm. So I had to always go for that low efficiency incandescent bulb. Well, then people say, you know, that's crazy. You should be able to do full cost accounting. So now I can look at the lifetimes of these bulbs and I'm going to really think about those very efficient bulbs. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to taxes that a local government or a state government receives from different contractors. So if I'm a local contractor, I'm gonna pay a lot, of a lot of taxes to the local government. If I'm, say, a paper supplier like Staples with no contact in the state, I may pay no tax. Well, you should take that into account as part of your full cost accounting of what the real price of these two things is. So I think if we start to do the accounting properly, not just with purchasing, but with investing. So for example, to take the investing exam example I talked about with, with Arizona, if you could get Tucson and Phoenix to really just show that by putting money into these local banks, even though maybe they're paying a little bit more in interest, um, <clears throat> these local banks are generating all this new economic activity which has to be taken into account. We started, I'd like to go back to where we started. We st you started by talking about real prosperity as being the kind where your money doesn't disappear. For those who are listening to this and thinking, oh, this is just moving the chairs on the Titanic of our crappy, excuse me, of our screwed up economy, what do you say? Why should they care about securities law? Well, I, I think they should care about securities law because what it means, what, what this investment apartheid situation means, is that all of us are systematically over-investing in companies we distrust and under-investing in the businesses that you care about and love. And unless we fix that set, those sets of personal choices, we're never going to fix this big problem. Michael Schumann, thanks so much for joining us. The book is Local Dollars, Local Sense. There's a new one coming soon. We'll bring you back to talk about that one, too. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks. Word came out about this new uh, opportunity they called the green economy. A light bulb went off in my head when it said that this was an opportunity where people could create businesses and jobs for themselves. My name is Stephen Evans. Soy Josefina Luna. Soy Evelyn Fuentes. Laura Holmes. Guadalupe Gonzalez. Timothy Hall. And I'm a worker owner. Trabajadora y dueña. Worker owner. Dueña y trabajadora. And I'm a worker owner at Ciro. Ciro is a full service source separation, recycling, reduction, and organic composting business serving restaurants in Roxbury, Dorchester, and East Boston. A group of folks who are from those communities came together, wanted to create jobs for themselves, and wanted to have a cooperative business that adhered to this triple bottom line, planet, people, and profits. Ciro was the, the answer. Workers from unemployed and underemployed backgrounds 
coming together on their own initiative to form an enterprise, you know, that respects their individuality, their needs, uh, you know, uh, respects their, their, their labor, you know, and also does this great service to the community uh, by helping to drive recycling up. In 2014, there's going to be an organic waste ban where all the restaurants, uh, commercial businesses have to start composting the organic waste. And so there's a huge opportunity to have a business that can take advantage of this new market. Por cada libra de comida que se sirve en un restaurante, hay media libra que es basura. Cuando nosotros vamos a recoger los desechos de comida de los restaurantes, nosotros vamos a hacer abono. Entonces nosotros eso lo vamos a llevar a la farm. Y eso va a producir los nuevos alimentos, los vegetales, las frutas. Y ese es el alimento que va a volver a nuestras mesas. So what speaks to me is I, we pay a lot of money for our trash pickup here. <laughs> So I think being a one-stop pickup point, you know, the one-stop recycling plus the compost plus the trash is, is unique. When I was first hearing the term about cooperatives, it was the same term that they use about the green economy, green pathways out of poverty. Ya no vamos a estar dependiendo de, 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 de esas grandes compañías que solo vienen, a, que solo quieren lucrarse de nuestro trabajo. And it's really good because it's the first, and uh, the first co-op between low-income Afro-Americans and low-income Latinos, working together. So we have all this, this, this melting pot of people, but if we could just blend together and work together, that becomes a great political power and a great financial power. Vamos a subsistir nosotros mismos y, y va a quedar en la misma comunidad. Uno mismo gana el dinero y lo distribuye o lo gasta aquí mismo. CERO is an opportunity to show that we're stepping up and we're at the table. We're interested in changing how restaurant recycling and disposal gets done, but also in changing how local investment gets done. So this campaign is to raise the seed money to create the structure for local investment. Local people are going to be able to become equity investors in CERO Co-op and help buy the machinery and equipment to run the business. The way that CETO is trying to create local investment vehicles for local individuals as a way of financing their company is great for me. And I want to be a part of them being tremendously successful because I really do want to see this proliferate. And I think it's part of a vision for a just and sustainable future that we have to start acting toward as well as thinking toward. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. It tells you something about what's laughingly called the public debate when the most dovish voice on the question of terrorism and war is coming from a leader of the military-industrial complex. Jens Stoltenberg is secretary director of NATO. He has yet to appear in the U.S. media in connection with the attacks on France, but he was there in Paris for the Unity Rally this month, and he's been interviewed on the BBC saying radical things like individuals, not groups, should be held responsible for criminal acts. Stoltenberg knows whereof he speaks. He was prime minister of Norway when madman Anders Breivik killed 77 mostly teenagers in the deadliest attack on that country since World War II. Instead of acting tough and calling for new powers to wage war, Stoltenberg at that time called on Norwegians to, quote, counter blind hate with argument and education. Interviewed on the BBC about the attacks in France this year, he said, crazy, dovish things like, quote, we have to distinguish between open debates and acts of violence. He even implied there was a role for courts. Criminal acts have to be prosecuted with means of police and bringing those responsible to justice, he told the World Service. You can see why he's not on TV in the States. When UN Human Rights Chief Mary Robinson declined to call 9-11 an act of war, she lost her post and her voice in the media right quick. That's what I thought would happen to Stoltenberg. There's no visible place for controversial views like these in the great free press we keep hearing about. Luckily for him, there is a way back into the U.S. media's good graces. Soon after the Paris Unity Rally, Stoltenberg announced NATO's new ultra-rapid reaction force called Spearhead, a military contractor's wet dream. He did get quoted in AP talking about that. You can write to me, tell me what you think, laura at grittv.org. And thanks.